What is your picture of the Christian life? In Western culture, probably we have made it more like the building that churches meet in. After all, we look at our lives and we seek comfort. We have air conditioning and heating. We sit on padded pews. We demand high-speed Wi-Fi internet connections and enjoy electronically sophisticated worship services. That's what we think. And the picture of what you think something is is what you really think it is. That's the reality of your life. In fact, it becomes a reflection of how should look like. If you were to ask the Hebrew writer, what is your picture of the Christian life? You wouldn't find much comfort there. His view, his image, is that of a race. There were games that were held in many places around the Roman Empire. They're held in Corinth for hundreds of years, as they were on Mount Olympus. But the primary, the primary event of all the games in that area of that time was a race called the Stadia. It wasn't long. It was only about 200 meters. That was not the point. The point was the prize. The victor was given freedom from taxes. He was exempt from military service, and he had so many other perks that it was worth getting all that you had to win that race. So that's the image the Hebrew writer chooses in Hebrews chapter 12. And he lets us know that a sturdy faith is more than attending church services. It's running that race well. And so when the Hebrew writer describes life, he shows four different facets associated with living to the end in the face of trouble. The first thing he talks about are the witnesses. Crowds are important. There is something called home field advantage. In professional football, the, the team that has it the most are the Seattle Seahawks. When their home crowd comes to Century Link Field, they are the loudest crowd in American football. When they measure the noise level of the screaming in that stadium on a decibel meter, it rivals a jet engine. It is so important to them that they have made a deal with Texas A&M for limited rights to the name the 12th man. That is the difference the crowd makes. And so the Hebrew writer, when he begins to write about this race, he talks about the cloud of witnesses. First one says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who are those witnesses? Well, they're all the named and unnamed people from Hebrews chapter 11. The people who were there to please God, the people who paid the price, the people who have suffered with their lives. They've given everything they had to do what God asked them to do. You see, they're not there as spectators or as a cheering section. Now, that's how we usually paint this verse. But the word witness is the word we get the word martyr from. These are people who, if you read, read the 11th chapter again, these are people who have already stood together in fact, that's what it says in the last verse of chapter 11. Together, he's going to make us perfect. Perfect. These are the people who've already run the race. They've already endured the problems of life. They have survived and flourished. You know, we really need people who are behind us, who have accomplished what we're trying to accomplish to bolster us, to encourage us, to give us stamina. We, Whenever we do something hard, it usually has somebody who has been there before who said, this is what we want to do. Charles Duhigg in his book, Smarter, Better, Faster, tells the story of the Marine Corps boot camp. It's not the way it used to be. It's been refurbished for better recruits, I suppose. One of the things they do is as they train young men to become Marines, the very last experience they have is an exercise called the Crucible. The Crucible is a 52-hour event. 
full pack together as a platoon. They finish together. They wash out together. And they get to sleep two hours at a time. Meals are very short. It's a grueling, grueling two and a half days. It's easy to want to quit. But they have come up with a technique of trying to help these young men and young ladies keep at it. Whenever they begin to stall, whenever they begin to fatigue, whenever they want to feel like they just kind of drop off, the platoon surrounds each person. And in a call and respond fashion, they say, why are you doing this? And everyone has to give their why. And they found out the more they could connect the why to what they were doing, the more each one of them could respond to each other. The ones who were struggling together, they could survive. They could live. They would make it to the end, no matter how hard it was. You see, that's that cloud of witnesses we're talking about. They are there not just to say, oh, I watched. They're to say, I've been there. And I'm sitting in these stands because I've run that same race course. And I've been the same problem. And I have survived it. And I have pleased God. You can too. Watch me. So... It says they are a cloud of witnesses as well. That could mean a lot of things, but it probably means all-encompassing. It's like when you're flying in a plane and you move into a cloud. The cloud is all around you. You don't see anything but the cloud. And and so there is this all-encompassing sense that we have people around us who have lived the Christian life, who have done the things that they needed to do, who have pleased God. Who can and we can point to and say, that's the people I want to be like. See, the value of fellowship is not in friendship, but it's in endurance. Because there are so many people who have gone before, and they're the ones who can point the way and provide motivation. There are people whose faith is sturdy enough to last to the end, but they are the ones who have encouragers who have survived and thrived and kept going against all odds, they've come to say, join me. I'll be with you. So there are two questions I'd like to ask you. The first is, who are your cloud of witnesses? Who do you have in your life, probably older, more experienced, who can say, here's what I've learned, Here's how I've run. Here's where I've had problems. Here's where I can help you. We all need them. Who's on that list for you? But secondly, and probably more importantly, will you be part of that cloud of witnesses so that others can seek you out? We always reach forward to people we need, and we backward to people who need us. So who are those people in your life? And so as he paints the scene, as he starts with the background of the cloud of witnesses, the Hebrew writer moves on to the second point. There's some preparation we all have to do in order to run the race. No one gets up on a morning and says, you know, I think I'm going to run a marathon today. Now, that's a recipe for disaster and pain. Usually years before you strap on the the shoes and put one step in front of another for 26 miles, you start to plan and prepare. Months or years, you, you start by walking, then running a little bit. Then you run farther and you run longer. But it takes a while. And you have to train to get ready for that, to prepare for the moment. It's interesting that during this time of COVID-19 shelter at home, the people who are, who are trying to figure out how to prepare for something the most are professional athletes. After all, they know that one day their sport will come back. And when it happens, they need to be ready physically to play the game. Baseball players are one. 
probably because it's the nearest season to us. Uh, there have been pictures on places like Instagram where a, a pitcher has set up a a pitching target in his backyard where he does his warm ups and he does his his workouts in his own backyard, throwing hard baseballs in a net. Now the one I like is one of the members of the Texas Rangers that he's wanting to keep his skills at batting up, but the problem is he lives in an apartment. And so he's constructed a batting cage in his apartment. Can you just imagine being his neighbor? And every time you, you're being constantly bombarded by the thwack of a bat on a baseball. But you see, they're preparing. They're getting ready. They're keeping themselves lean and strong. That's what the Hebrew writer describes in this passage. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now think about that verse for a moment. All the things that have to take place in order to run well. First of all, there's that weight. The, the things that hinder us. Uh, it, that's a word that really means just you cannot make forward progress very well. It makes running difficult. You know, we know all that. When, when it's time for a runner to run a race, uh, they will take off their warm-up suit and lay it aside. Why? It has done its job, but now they need to be as, as lean as they can. They need to take anything that's going to create drag out of, out of their, their body and be only what they need to get there. It may have worked well at one time, but to run the race, they have to take off the things that are too heavy. There are boxers as they come to the ring. And when they start working out, they, they may have splurged some and, and they put on a few pounds and their trainer will say, man, we got to get that off. You're, you're not going to move around very much. You're just too heavy. And, and so professional athletes, for instance, know that the best way to prepare is to get rid of those things that, that are creating the drag and, and keeps you from doing what you need to do in a forward way. But the Hebrew writer goes on to talk about a second part of that, which is the sin that so easily entangles. Now, he doesn't tell you what the sin is. That's because it's not a particular sin that's in general. It's the sin that bothers you or that bothers me. It's peculiar to us. It's our own problem. And so you have to find your own sin. You have to find out what is it in your life that is that is entangling you. And that word tangled gives us a hint about what he's really talking about. This is the only time in the New Testament this word is ever used. And it, it means it's something that is that you admire, something that you enjoy, something you want to hold on to. And there's things in our life uh, that if you think about them, we kind of enjoy things that we shouldn't be doing. We tolerate them because they give us some form of, of satisfaction. We've always painted sin as a very terrible thing. Most of the time, the terribleness is in the consequences. But the pleasure is in the moment. And that's what is true when the Hebrew writer talks about the sin that entangles. The sin that entangles is that which is pleasant, which you enjoy, which you would like to hold on to. That if you had to give it up, it would cause you some measure of grief and loss. Since those two things, the weighty things and the entangling things, they need to be shed, get rid of them. See, Paul uses that, that term, get rid of, in two different places, probably parallel passages, in fact. One's in Colossians 3, verse 8, where he says, but now you must also rid yourselves of such things. And he lists them, things like anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. He said, those are things you rid yourselves of. You take off like a piece of clothing in the summertime. You take off, if you had a heavy coat on and it's 90 degrees outside, you would take it off because it doesn't serve you well at that moment. It's, it's overheating you. You don't feel comfortable. He says, those are things you take off. 
in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, he says it again. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires. There are things that used to belong to our lives before we were Christians that we don't need in our lives any longer. We need to put those off. We need to rid ourselves. We need to shed them like, like clothes that don't do us any good or like chains that hold us back. There are a lot of things that can include. As the Hebrew writer says, they're individual, not generic. They may be habits or mannerisms were picked up along the way that need to be discarded. Paul calls them old ways. Things like rage, malice, slander, language. It could be an attraction to too many things. A love of too much money. A desire to be a little bit more comfortable than we should. An ego that says, I'm always right. And you never learn. All of those things may be part of this, this passage, but you have to figure out what it is for you. But the hardest part of the Christian life is changing the part of your life that we don't want to change, but it doesn't serve a purpose. My father smoked as a young man. He developed a habit when he was in the Navy. He was aboard a ship anchored in Shanghai, China. And there he learned that the boredom and the stress of that created a need, and everybody smoked cigarettes. His father had smoked, so it was an easy habit for him to develop. When I was born, he quit smoking. He decided he didn't want his son to be around cigarette smoke. So he quit. It was difficult for him, as it is with anyone. But he quit smoking. But once, it's an interesting thing. He always reminded himself of what he had done by keeping two objects. One day, when I was a small child, I was rifling through his leather briefcase, like small children always do. And what I found was a pack of cigarettes and a cigarette lighter. And so I asked him about it, and he told me the, kind of the story. But then he said, I quit because you didn't need it, so I didn't want it. There are good reasons to quit doing things we like to do or things we have done that maybe even served a purpose for us at one time. But if they don't help us get to heaven, if they don't help us live for Jesus, then there's those things that need to be disposed of. Scour your life for the impediments of life. Habits you enjoy. But be strong enough to say, for the race to eternity, I will shed that part of my life. It will be hard. No one says it isn't. But it will be worth it in the end. And then the Hebrew writer takes us to the race course. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. There's that word race. I don't know what race conjures up for you, but I do know what it did for them. The Greek for race is agon. Now, we tack on a Y at the end of that word, and it becomes agony. And that tells you everything about what the race is. A race is a struggle. A race takes everything out of you. It's difficult. In short, it's agony. Maybe living for Christ for us has become too easy. Perhaps in, in Western Christianity, 
Have we made the Christian life too simple, too convenient? After all, if it's hot or it's cold at church, we all complain. If we, It's like we need the convenience of the moment. And if we don't have the convenience of the moment, we can't live right. And yet, contrast that with the race of agony. The Hebrew writer says, I don't care if it's convenient or not. This is the race. But he then he goes on to talk about that their race, even though it's threatened by others, it was deprived of creature comforts and, and freedoms. It was their race, the course. He says the race is marked out before you. When ro- road races are, are done, they, designers design the course to be challenging. It's not all level paths. Instead, it's, there's a lot of uh, uphills, a lot of downhills, curves and twists and turns. And you, you get to rest in some places, but some places it's really hard. That's the course. It's been marked. It's a clearly marked path. You can see it in front of you. It's the course on which you run. The Hebrew writer says that Christians do not get to choose their own race course. God sets the course of the race. He's the one that determines what it takes, how hard it is. The race is God's to design, but it's only ours to run. And you cannot ignore the obstacles because the obstacles are part of the course. And if you don't run the entire course, you haven't run the race. He says, run the race. In 1980, the Boston Marathon was run won by a woman named Rosie Ruiz. In that race, she supposedly set the world's record for women for the marathon. The record was short-lived, though. Because suspicions were raised because when she came in, she didn't look like anyone who had run for 26 miles. And so they started doing some quiet investigation. And they found witnesses who said, yeah, she jumped out of the crowd with less than a mile ago. She didn't run the race. She didn't pay the price. She didn't suffer the agony. She ran a very easy loping race to the end, but it wasn't her race and it wasn't the course. She cheated. God says, I have laid this course out in front of you. It is the course I want you to run. It is the course that that has been marked out. And I want you to run the whole course, obstacles and all, uphill and downhill. It is hard. It is agony. But run the race to the end. That brings the Hebrew writer the area of focus. How distractible are you? When our dog was alive, she would want to walk twice a day. So in the morning, I'd get up and put on shoes and some shorts, and we'd go outside. And and I'd walk the dog until a squirrel came dashing by. And when that squirrel came dashing by, suddenly I was no longer walking the dog. The dog was walking me. Have you ever missed a turn in your car because you were busy on your phone and suddenly you realize you have to make a U-turn and go backward because you missed something? The requirement of our time is something that's in such short supply. It's something called focus. It is if we do three things at once, we're doing nothing at all, really. And it's required for Christian living on top of that. In fact, it's an incredibly important element. The Hebrew writer goes on in verse 2, says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, that's a verb in the present tense. It means to put your eyes on Jesus and never take them off of him. Why do that? He goes on to say that fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He, first of all, uses the name Jesus, the human name. It's something we can relate to. Jesus was a man the Hebrew light, light as we are, but without sin. 
it's something we can relate to, not some ethereal being out there who is, has uniqueness. It says he is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He is both the source and destination. You see, in Jesus, we have both beginning and end of the Christian life. We start our Christian life by being baptized into Christ, and we end our lives by standing before him in judgment. His is the only voice that counts. No critic, no commentator, no other voice counts. Only what Jesus does and says. And so when we focus on what Jesus wants from us, not what other people say we ought to do, that's the focus we need. And we know that because he went first. The Hebrew writer would go on to say, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he endured and sat down at the right hand. If you look at that one statement, Jesus saw the end. He knew the struggle. He felt the same and experienced the glory. No one knows the plight of a runner like the one who has run it before perfectly. He's experienced the beginning, the middle, and the end of our experience. So he knows what it's like. So he can say, here, I can show you the way. Why do you need to focus that badly? Why is it that the intensity of fixing our eyes on Jesus and never taking them off is so important? It's because of the dangers. Verse 3, he says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He says, consider him. Now, it's a curious word in the Greek language. When it comes over into English, it comes over as the word analogy. It's really a mathematical type term, and it has the sense, a verbal sense of an equal sign. And, and what the Hebrew writer is, says, you put Jesus on one side of the sign and you on the other side, and you see how close you get. That's what you do when you consider Jesus. You don't just sit and ruminate. You, you make sure you, you compare your life with his because that's the goal is to get them to as equal as you can get them. That's where the consideration is. That's where the analogy is. We do what Jesus does and did. That's not to be saying that we have to be perfect, but in running the race, we have to do like he did, to endure the pain and the suffering like he did. Because if you don't, you'll grow weary. Weariness is a word that has sweat on its brow and its muscles ache. You just get weary at times from, from fatigue, from being hard labor. If you ever worked out in the yard for a full day, maybe in the spring or the fall, and you've been raking leaves or you've been and pulling rocks or doing whatever. And by the time you get finished, you barely move. That's that word, weary. Uh, we're experiencing what's been called COVID-19 fatigue right now. We're tired of hearing about it. And we're tired of being inside. And so even though we know we need to be safe, we start to fudge the instructions and let down our guard and expose ourselves to danger. See, one of the strategies of the devil is not to go full out on a frontal assault with us. That's not what he does at all. Instead, he just slowly, over time, wears away our endurance. Day by day, we grow a little tired, a little unfocused, and we wear down. And we decide we want something a little more pleasant than this, a little more easy than this. And the devil says, once you get too weary, then the Hebrew writer continues, the result is losing heart. When a person loses heart, they just want to free themselves of the burden. They don't want to be underneath it anymore. 
They don't want it to be hard anymore in their life. They don't want it to be difficult anymore in their life. They don't want to have to mind the rules anymore in their life. They just want to give it up. That's why I don't you lose heart. Just get out from underneath the burden. And that's what happens when you take your eyes off of Jesus. You begin to see all the problems without even the potential. You see the gore without the glory. It happened with Peter. Matthew chapter 14 portrays a very difficult day in the life of Jesus. He learns of the death of his friend John the Baptist, his cousin. He goes off by himself. And in the night, the disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee, rowing in the darkness. When they, they see an image, a, a figure of some sort in the darkness coming out after them, and they strain to watch. And the more they strain, the more they realize who it is. It's Jesus, but he's walking out here on water. And they must have been perplexed, everybody but Peter. And Peter, who was all foul mouth and no plan, said, I know what to do. Let me come walk to you on the sea. Jesus said, if you can. So he got out of the boat. I don't know what he felt like when he put his foot down on that water. And, and it was sturdy. It didn't move. He could walk. He'd take a step or two. Then all of a sudden, something hit him. He could feel the waves lapping at his ankles. He could feel the brine slapping his face. And he began to look around at the sea and the storms. He lost focus on Jesus. And it says he began to sink. That's a perfect description of the way we live our lives sometimes. We spend so much time looking at the problems of life that we don't fix our eyes on Jesus any longer. If we'd ever just fix our eyes on Jesus, we'd be okay. We could push through this. We would not grow weary. We would have the model. We would have the person who's done this. We will know it's possible because it's been, ha it's been done by him. That's when we fall off the course, when we take our focus off the reason we're living. See, it's not really about looking good. It's not about the appearances of Christianity. And it's not even about salving your conscience. It's really about pleasing the Lord. And the only way you're going to please God is to keep your eyes on him who has already walked the walk before us. For you see, sturdy faith runs the race well. It prepares, it considers, and it runs. But the key element is something called endurance. Three times in these three verses, that one word weaves them all together. It is the key word for the book of Hebrews. Listen to what it says together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us draw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance. The race is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's that old word again. The King James was called steadfastness. Here it can be called perseverance, endurance, many things. It's just that word that means live under the circumstances. That's not clear to us usually. James Clear, the author, made an observation about the difference between patience and persistence. He said the most useful form of patience is persistence. But patience implies waiting for things to improve on their own. Persistence implies keeping your head down and continuing to work when things no longer happen as you expect. That is persistence. We keep running the race, even though it's hard, even though we want to quit, we keep our eyes on Jesus, 
and we run well. Don't quit until you fall over the end of the finish line and you get invited into the great cloud of witnesses where you can say, I ran the race God gave me. Prepare, focus, and run. By 7 p.m. on October 20, 1968, the Mexico City Olympic Stadium, the sun began to set. They were about to turn off the lights. The air was getting cool in the mountains. The last of the Olympic marathon runners were being assisted at a first aid station. And over an hour earlier, the winner, Mama Waldi of Ethiopia, had crossed the, the finish line, winning the 26-mile, 365-yard race, looking just as strong and as vigorous as he started. There were a few thousand spectators left in the stands, and they got up preparing to leave. When suddenly they heard the blare of police sirens and whistles. It was a signal that a runner was coming through the gate. A soul figure, wearing the colors of Tanzania, came limping into the stadium. His name was John Stephen Aquari. He was the last man to finish the marathon in 1968. His leg was bandaged and bloodied. He had taken a bad fall early in the race. Now it was all he could do, just to limp around the, the track. The crowd that was left stood and applauded as he completed his last lap. Finally, when he crossed the finish line, there was a man dared to ask him the question that everybody wanted to ask. You were so badly injured. Why didn't you just quit? Why didn't you just give up? Quietly, a quarry with a dignity only he could have, replied, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start a race. They sent me to finish it. So God has put a race in front of us. And he says, I gave all. I've sent you here to finish the race. Let's finish the race. Let's close by praying together. There are so many people that we need to mention that uh, you have heard about uh, through newsletters and various other ways. Uh, two in particular, Michelle Stanley has been uh, diagnosed and is struggling with COVID-19 at home. The other are, is Jennifer and Wesley Lackey and their newborn child, Tyke. Tyke was born and he's been having intestinal problems uh, and is still in the hospital. Doctors are having men are trying to deal with the problem he has, and uh, they are doing whatever they can to to cure this, this situation, uh, so he can go home. And so there are those issues that we need to pray about. And also, I like you to continue to remember the Waterview elders. We're we're caught in the middle of a of a difficulty in leadership right now. To how to open back to worship services in the safest possible way, in a way that we can all worship God together again the right way. So today we'd like to end with prayer, so will you bow with me? Father, we're grateful for the day. And Father, we know our life is a race, a, a race to the end. We also feel the, the weariness at times. We have those temptations to to say, it's just too hard for me. Uh, Father, we pray that we always will keep our eyes on you, that we we'll always look at Jesus who has run the race before us, who says, this is the way we can get there. Come with me. Father, help us to do that. Today, we pray for Michelle Stanley and for the lackeys. We pray for those who have lost jobs and the, the downturn of the economy after COVID-19. So many of our members feel that that pinch. We pray for those who are recovering in so many ways uh, from the illnesses of, of the times. And we pray for those who are, who are afraid for what the future holds. 
and help us to realize that we don't know what the future holds. We just know who holds the future. Father, we pray for the, the Waterview elders as they still continue contemplating what's the best course of action at this time. And we pray for their strength and for their wisdom as they guide us together. And Father, we ask as we leave this class, we begin for begin preparing for worship. You'll keep us in the mind of the Spirit on this Lord's Day. With the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week.